Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the latest installment in the FPRI Asia Programs a series of talks. I'm Jacques Delisle, I'm Director of the Asia Program here at FPRI and also Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. It gives me a great pleasure to uh, welcome to our webinar here uh, Rosalind Shea. Rosalind Shea is Associate Professor of Political Science at Temple and Co-Director of the Certificate in Political Economy there. Uh, she is the author of China's Regulatory State, A New Strategy for Globalization that came out in the 2010s, and just recently, just last year, she has out a new book, which she's going to be talking about with us today, Micro-Industrial Foundations of Capitalism, Sectoral Pathways to Globalization in China, India, and Russia. Uh, she's frequently featured, uh, interviewed in major media. You can uh, find her on the BBC, The Economist, Foreign Affairs, NPR, Washington Post, things like that. And she was also a Global Order Visiting Scholar here at Perry World House at Penn. Uh, so great to welcome you uh, to our, our program here. I'll be to say a couple of things uh, as we get started here, just a reminder on ground rules. Uh, Rosie will uh, be giving us a, uh, an overview of, of, of the book, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A, a, a little bit of discussion here. Uh, if you want to participate in the, in the question and answer or comment period, please do. You can do that by submitting your comments in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we'll turn to that a little more than halfway through our uh, podcast, probably. And the last thing I'm supposed to say here is that these uh, events are, of course, free to you, but not free to us. So please consider supporting FPRI, joining us, uh, or otherwise donating. So without further ado, uh, Professor Shia, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, tell us about the micro in industrial foundations, or micro institutional foundations of capitalism. Great. Thank you so much, Jax, for that introduction. It is just my great pleasure to be here um, at FPRI. And um, as I was telling our organizers today that um, I had visited FPRI in person prior to the pandemic. And um, it was always um, such a um, delightful time and of learning and um, talking about policy. So it, it, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to be here to share my book and um, to speak with you about policy implications. And so without much ado, I'm just going to um, turn on my PowerPoint presentation. And um, as I was telling Jax that, um, please go ahead and stop me. Um, as you probably know, professors sometimes can go on and on. So please stop me when you know the time is, is up and we should have um, a, a good discussion. So um, the book is Micro-Institutional Foundations of Capitalism, Sectoral Pathways to Globalization in China, India, and Russia. Um, this book was published last year, um, last fall, and um, I've been on a book tour, and it's just been so great interacting with different audiences, and I'm really excited to talk about po uh, policy implications today. Um, as Jax mentioned already, I'm also the author of China's Regulatory State, A New Strategy for Globalization, and um, um, it was really the first book to identify um, China's strategic regulation um, post WTO accession um, across industrial sectors. And happy to also chat about findings of that book and how it relates to um, this new book. Um, I just wanted, you know, talk a little bit about the motivation and some of the banner takeaways of um, microinstitutional foundations. Um, so, you know, I begin with this idea that everyone assumes there's a model to explain transition economies in the context of global economic integration, right, in the age of neoliberalism, in the age of globalization. And the assumption is that we have national level linear unitary globalization trajectories. What I do here in this new book is that I extend China's regulatory explain, a state and I explore the analytical utility of taking my study cross regionally to the industry and the subsector, which allows me to uncover a new model of globalization, a new model of globalization that is not national, that is not just national level, but that really we need to um, open the in, in many ways, the black box of the national and go to the industry to see these national configurations of sectoral models. It's what I call them. And um, what I do is I introduce the strategic value framework, which allows me to explain the substantive differences of these national configurations of sectoral models. Because we have countries that are indeed globalizing, opening their economies to the outside world, but there are sectoral level re-regulation. And that looks differently across these countries, across globalizing countries. 
And so what I do in identifying the national configurations of sectoral models with a strategic value framework is I, I tackle the big questions, right? I tackle the big uh, countries. I compare China, India, Russia. These are regional global powers of comparable size with existing industrial bases and similar timing in globalization. Um, beginning with um, what I do is I look back historically, but I also have a very critical juncture of um, point of departure. And that's um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the um, early 1990s, the big bang liberalization in India in early 1990s. And then of course, China re-entering the um, the global economy after Tiananmen Square in um, 92 and beyond. And what I do is I examine labor intensive industries, labor intensive, um, less value added industries such as apparel and clothing. And then I compare um, with capital intensive industries such as telecommunications. For both large industries, I also take it to the subsector. So I look at services and manufacturing in telecommunications and then in textiles, apparel and clothing, but also technical textiles. And when I discuss some of the technical textiles um, findings, that's where um, uh, we do see the re-regulation that I'm gonna be talking about, um, you know, similar to some of the re-regulation that we see in telecommunications. So I already mentioned already the research puzzle, these countries have liberalized and joined the global economy. They have done so in a way that appear to have departed from the East Asian developmental state, right? The iconic model of the developmental state, state-led development. And they have departed in the sense that these countries restricted foreign direct investment to promote the domestic sector. And up until recently, really, until the world started you know, watching in Xi Jinping era and beyond, for example, in China, China appear to be quite open to globalization and appear not to have restricted foreign direct investment. Now, for those folks who read my first book, um, you would know that in fact, that it was not entirely um, the, the correct picture, but this is the large assumption um, in terms of conventional wisdom. At the same time, even as these three large developing countries had opened their economies to, um, to the global economy, they hadn't adopted, um, iconically speaking, as a Latin American model, right? This is the model where, um, uh, you know, generally speaking, liberal foreign direct uh, investment policies, um, uh, leaning into neoliberal ideas of privatization, marketization, and in many ways, a lot of scholars have also found exploitation by coalitions of foreign direct investment and domestic interest. And so what we've seen is that these national configurations of sectoral models that I've identified have departed from these two iconic models of, of development. And uh, here I'm just showing some you know, quick data on how foreign direct investment as percentage of GDP in 1980 for these three countries, we don't even have data for Russia because it was still under um, the Soviet Union, uh, not much foreign direct investment at all. Fast forward um, 15 years, we see that actually by this time, um, these countries in terms of FDI as percentage of GDP are much more open um, to the global economy. And so, you know, if you look at the traditional East Asian developmental state, all three countries exceed um, Japan, um, Taiwan, and, and, and South Korea. And um, compared to um, the Latin America um, country, you know, you have Brazil, where, um, you know, much in South Africa, the BRICS, other BRICS countries um, being, um, you know, quite open to, to FDI. By 2015, um, these, uh, we have uh, China kind of, um, you know, nestled into the, the global economy and these three countries being, um, you know, uh, right next to each other in terms of percentage of FDI um, to GDP. Now, um, this is a, just a picture across time. Now we do see ebbs and flows across time. And some of those ebbs and flows could be explained by, you know, global financial crises, um, could be explained also what I um, call the national configurations of um, sectoral models. Other um, uh, measures of, of global openness, exports of goods and services as percentage of GDP. So in many ways, these three countries are com quite, uh, comparable. And so I um, argue we could um, uh, compare them um, with similar point of departure. 
What we find though, once we open the national economy and go to the sectoral level, all three countries have re-regulated in ways that vary by country and sector within country, leading to distinct development outcomes. So these national configurations of sectoral models have led to distinct development outcomes. In terms of just you know uh, some some data um, measures or de indicators, right? The conventional wisdom is that for science and technology, China outperforms the other two countries. And indeed, if we just look at S and T patents ninety to twenty fifteen here, it does appear China adheres to conventional wisdom. It outperforms um, uh, India and Russia. Once we disaggregate disaggregate to the sector level, we see that that picture is actually a lot more complex, right? We have, you know, let's just take telecommunications and look at um, uh, telecoms at the subsector. We have, you know, ICT versus telecoms and these three countries here. And we see actually on that same measure of patents um, from the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, what we see is that indeed there, it, the picture is much more complicated. It's not just um, China outperforming the other two countries. So these national configurations of sectoral models, which I explained the differences um, uh, nationally and then also within country um, across industries with a strategic value framework that I introduce in the book, um, help us demystify this picture of national level um, variation and sector level variation. So uh, I make the claim that I introduced a new theory of globalization pass pathways. We have market governance structures that mediate the relationship between globalization and development. I zero in on market governance structures and I zero in on market governance structures at the national and sector level. The strategic value framework theorizes that how state elites perceive the strategic value of sector in response to internal and external pressures um, will explain why we see these sectoral models um, once we open the box of the national. That um, in addition to how state elites perceive strategic value of sector, we need to also examine sectoral structures and existing organization of institutions. And it is important to look at sectoral structures and organization of institutions. Um, just, you know, it's that telecoms will be telecoms, whether you are in India or in, um, in, in Russia uh, and China. And at the same time, existing organization of institutions, how these institute, how these sectors are organized at the national level will matter, which is why um, the strategic value framework synthesizes and bring together the ideational level and the the, uh, the objective ideational level, objective conditions, and then also um, uh, intersubjective institutional uh, factors. And these interacting strategic value and sectoral logics will then shape the national within country sectoral patterns. Um, just to front load these country specific substantive findings, um, the micro institutional foundations of capitalism, my book identifies um, in the national configurations of sectoral models that China, we see sectoral, uh, techno security developmentalism, which have shaped bifurcated capitalism, um, centralizing the governance of high tech dual use sectors, decentralizing labor intensive, less value added sectors. Um, and of course, happy to discuss um, uh, uh, sectoral um, um, findings and then um, also policy implications. In India, we have what I um, identified as neoliberal self-reliance shaping bifurcated lab, uh, liberalism, this idea of centralizing the governance of small-scale rural sectors, decentralizing high-tech globally connected sectors. In Russia, the resource security nationalism shapes bifurcated oligarchy, which centralizes governance of infrastructure and resource sectors and decentralizes labor-intensive, less value-added sectors. And um, techno security developmentalism, neoliberal self reliance, and resource security nationalism, these national configurations and the micro governance outcomes that um, where we see sectoral level um, patterns of market governance, these are explained by my strategic value 
framework. Analytical takeaways, we take um, the study to the sector. I theorize multidimensional impacts of sectors. I'm able to adjudicate competing explanations, identifying objective economic and political pressures and intersubjective ideational and value Latin interpretations. And then empirically, we see that indeed, these three countries as they globalized, um, have globalized, right, in a way that um, uh, adhere to um, this idea of the globalization age, and yet we see sector level differences, and um, and and then they um, differ in why this is so, and also differ in development outcomes. Um, happy to talk about the impacts of global conflict and cooperation policy responses um, near the end of um, my talk. Okay, so just a little quick note about research design. Um, it's a comparative case research design at different levels of analysis. I process trace uh, from sectoral origins. So I do go back historically at the origins of these sectors. Um, but then I also look from 1980, particularly 1990 and beyond. Um, I, I look at the country, industry, subsector, and then I have comp company case studies in the book that substantiates these sector, subsector, and country level um, arguments. These are based on hundreds of over 200 and more of semi-structured in-depth interviews, on-site visits to all three countries, also to New York, Silicon Valley, Washington, DC, with key government, industry, company, and civil society stakeholders, including sector associations, business associations, foreign delegations, um, and, and so forth. I also use published and unpublished documentary evidence, descriptive statistics by national governments, business industry associations, fellow de uh, delegations, and international organizations. So this book is substantiated with and triangulated with qualitative and qualitative and archival data, um, giving me confidence to draw these arguments about the national configuration of sectoral models. Um, just a you know quick picture of the field. Um, this is a picture I took here, you know, a, a, a bookstore in Moscow, and uh, here in Delhi at the, um, uh, it, it, you know, um, with um, actually one of the um, uh, the uh, the one of the, um, the the outdoor museums that was going on. And then here we have a bookstore in uh, Wang Fujing. And so just here with this picture, I'm, I'm showing you that these, th these three countries were interested in the world, but also they themselves are interested in each other. Okay, and so the picture of in the upper right um, of, of um, in, in Delhi is actually um, an outdoor museum about development in Brazil, and and that's another thing I um, would venture out to say. And um, in side projects that I have done with um, my graduate students and other collaborators, is that the strategic value framework could actually be helpful to look at at the national configurations of sectoral models in other countries, including um, you know, Brazil and South Africa and, um, and um, other uh, globalizing economies. Um, I word about the dependent variable. Um, I look at market governance. And what I do um, in looking at market governance is that I argue that there are two dimensions. We have the um, the dimension of the role of the state in market coordination, but we also have the dimension of property rights arrangements. And the reason when I look at market governance at the dependent variable, I look at these two dimensions is that we can no longer, particularly in these transition countries, we can no longer just look at ownership, right? I mean, even in the example of the um, the aerial surveillance program that we are beginning to um, detect that China has been adopting in the last several years. Um, these are civil military fusion companies. They're companies that are may appear private in nature, but are either state sponsored or have some sort of state intervention. Um, and so that dimension of the level and scope of state and market coordination is very important. It's not just the state owned enterprises that are that may be doing um, the bidding of the state that may be um, uh, 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 contributing to um, state goals um, and 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 um, state intentions, and so and this is also true in um, in democracies like India, where it is a socialist transition economy, particularly in the 1990s and beyond era. So 
just because um, an organization may have state enterprise or state um, ownership roots and may even have um, majority state ownership today, it doesn't mean that it's actually um, uh, coordinated or have a lot of state intervention in terms of you know market entry, market exit, uh, state uh, 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 scope, uh, the role of the state in um, in regulating business scope and investment level and so forth. So this is why it's very important as we look at the distribution of property rights that we also look at the level and scope of the state and market coordination. So again, this is the dependent variable side and I come up with a, con a conceptual map and taxonomy of market governance in, 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 the, in the book. Um, and this is important to look at that uh, market coordination because this is where the you know, central level and decentralized level or mixed government authorities um, will matter. Why do we see sectoral variation on the decentralized and, de and more centralized sectors? Right? Why? Um, why is it that you know right now China is very well integrated into the global economy, but also certain parts of the economy is still very centralized, and and um, certain parts of the economy is very centralized. You regardless of the other dimension, the distribution of property rights, the other dimension um, where you know uh, the, where we see private stakeholders. Now, of course, we know we all know that for uh, as in the example in um, value added services and telecoms which traditionally has been less, um, uh, has experienced less state intervention um, in China, for example, um, in the very famous example of the Ant Group in 2020, where the state had intervened into a private company that was about to be listed globally, and yet we saw state intervention. Right? And so this is an example of why it's important to look at the distribution of property rights, but also um, the role of the state in market coordination. And together, I have this typology of market governance. Um, in the last 10 minutes or so that I have, I want to focus on, um, on looking, uh, 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 introducing strategic value framework. But before I do that, I just want to give a nod. Of course, there's existing debates, raging debates, very important debates where we, um, where um, uh, scholars have um, identified the op open economy politics, you know, uh, sectoral interests, subnational characteristics, his characteristics, historical legacies, regime type, global norms, markets, and organizations as very important factors that also drive market governance um, uh, yeah, in, in the global economy. And what I do is I call these other very important factors common forces of change. In the book, you will find that I don't eliminate these factors as being contributing to market governance patterns, but they are common forces of change. The common forces of change um, um, where uh, despite the common forces of change, we see those sexual level patterns where we see more centralized um, government control and certain distribution of property rights in certain sectors and more decentralized and distribution of property rights in other sectors. And this is where the strategic value framework um, uh, is, is very key in explaining the national configurations of the sectoral models. It allows us to explicate ex allows us to explicate patterns of market governance and how it varies by country and industry within country. So the strategic value framework theorizes that perceived strategic value of sectors um, as a function of economic and political pressures faced by the state will explain the dominant patterns of market governance. This is where the objective, right? Certain sectors will uh, contribute to the national technology base. Certain sectors will have application for national security. And so the, on the objective level, those sectors will be more um, strategic um, to um, state elite actors. And that will be true in democracies as well. At the same time, we're going to see sectoral structures and organization of institutions um, explaining market governance details. So the perceived strategic value, the political dimension, social political stability. What does a sector mean for regime legitimacy? And this is where um, it will differ by country. Labor intensive um, economies such as 
apparel textiles, such as the hand looms and the power looms, are going to be really important to the Indian economy, large economy where um, there is a, a very labor intense, uh, where there's a lot of labor and um, where hand looms and power looms, which are very low value um, added, highly pollutant, and but employs a lot of labor. So that's where you will see in India, for example, where there's a ministry of textiles industry, right? One of the only ministry of textiles in the world that exists today, coordinating even small scale um, uh, enterprises and small scale enterprises that are, um, that dates back from, um, uh, dates back to um, Gandhi nationalism and uh, dates back to um, Swadashi um, nationalism that led to the independence movement in India. And so on the intersubjective level, hawks back to nationalist interpretations and nationalist ideas, but also objectively, it is important for social political legitimacy. Objectively, it's important for economic growth and the competitiveness of the domestic economy. Um, and it will shape state goals, state methods, who controls industrial policy, what kind of measures are employed. But of course, there will be intersubjectivity in how state elites define, make claims of, and contest political and economic pressures. So the hypotheses are the higher the perceived strategic value of sector, and that's going to look different across countries, um, the more likely the state would enhance its control and centralize bureaucratic coordination and regulate market entry and business scope. On the flip side, the lower the perceived strategic value of sector, the more likely the state would require and uh, relinquish its control and decentralize bureaucratic coordination and deregulate market entry and business scope. I also have a bunch of... Um, Hypotheses regarding sectoral structures and organization of institutions that I will, um, uh, you know, really quickly um, talk about and then skip to the findings for each um, each country. So sectoral structures, I did make a nod earlier how nature of technological properties are going to be the same, right? Um, Technical textiles will, will have more technological properties. Um, core competencies are going to be similar for, similar for similar sectors across industries. But there will be nation-specific sectoral organization of institutions. Um, for example, I mentioned India. Um, the fact that there are small-scale industries that, um, that uh, prolifer uh, proliferate um, uh, the, the textiles industry, even in the face of a ministry of, um, of textiles. Those things are going to be sectoral structures that will have path dependent effects, shaping government goals and how measures are employed. I have a series of hypotheses um, regarding these, um, these um, sectoral structures and existing organization of institutions. And um, together, Michael, the, the strategic value framework identifies techno security developmentalism in, in China. Strategic are sectors with applications for national security, contribution to the national technology base, competitiveness of the domestic industry, in service of social and political stability, party legitimacy. These are going to be fixations since the founding of the People's Republic of China through the Cultural Revolution, Tiananmen Square incident, and um, the various. Um, global and economic crises. In India, neoliberal self-reliance. Strategic are going to be these rural, small-scale industries. They are going to be important for employment, um, sensitivity to sectarian level conflicts because of they are associated with post-independence nationalist imagination because of Gandhian Swadeshianism of self-reliance and that also then um, uh, uh, had uh, implemented over to function of Nehruvian socialism as well. But then on the other hand, you have high tech globalized sectors that um, had are going to be less strategic to Swandashian self reliance. And as a result, those are going to be the sectors, right? The ICT sectors. Those are going to be the sectors that have been very much shaped and influenced by neoliberal development in the post 1990s and beyond um, uh, a big bang liberalization in India. Um, and indeed that they still are uh, much more exposed to the global economy, but today, the uh, despite export oriented industrialization implemented by Modi, we still see 
um, you know, very firm level, subsector level, sector level um, uh, uh, exemptions, tariffs, and, and so forth, protecting the textiles industry. On Russia, um, we see resource security nationalism. Well, here we see um, path dependency of these more military um, defense-oriented telecommunications. One thing I should point out is that the conventional wisdom was that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, privatization, marketization, everything was let go. But in fact, the telecommunications industry, particularly landlines and the infrastructure part of telecoms, was only decentralized but not privatized. And because it was decentralized, but not privatized, what we saw in the post-Putin era, 1998 and beyond, was that Putin was able to centralize control of infrastructure. And then once Putin was able to control infrastructure, then it was able, uh, the Putin um, government was then able to control the infrastructure and even the value added service providers that are private, that. Um, had a lot of market competition that operate on top of that um, that uh, that uh, telecommunications infrastructure. So I just want to quickly show some photos. Um, telecom, super ministry, um, state-owned infrastructure, but lots of private actors, but that doesn't matter as much because market coordination is a very important um, dimension of a property uh, of market governance. Chinese textiles, one of the most decentralized um, sectors in, in the world um, and, um, in, in, and in the Chinese economy. But in technical textiles, we see more state level intervention, more state level coordination. And um, in the um, Fatian spacesuits of, um, you know, entirely made by civil military fusion type of companies, um, uh, uh, private companies that receive fu state funding um, to make um, and using nanotechnology to make um, new materials, um, the advanced materials that then allow China to go to um, to, to to space, and then also the materials that um, are on top of um, of the aerial balloons, and 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 of course the telecoms um, cameras and signals communications that was um, very much still very part of the centralized um, coordination of the government. India, just want to show a picture, even today, Modi has to um, appeal to the, the nationalist imagination. Here's a, a picture I have of Modi sitting, um, you know, right next to a hand loom, um, to, uh, um, uh, mimicking um, what Gandhi had done um, uh, right around the time of independence. Telecoms, on the other hand, um, there's a telecoms regulator, a lot of domestic and foreign players, very, very competitive um, to a point that Sometimes the foreign players are not that competitive. Um, central ministry protecting small scale producers. And then um, we do have some subnational and, and, and some uh, central level of promotion of technical sectors because there are more technological um, factors um, involved there. But at the same time, um, we see that, e that even in the more technical sectors, we have highly pollutant small scale power looms. Um, that you really just don't see across the global economy anymore. A picture of the power looms that um, power um, uh, the technical sectors of India. Here's a map of the telecoms infrastructure of um, Russia that was actually never let go even during um, the after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was just decentralized to the to the oblast to the regional level, and so that's why um, the Russian government was able to centralize control in a post-Putin era. But at the same time, the mobile and equipment sectors are highly competitive, value added services operating on top of the infrastructure, highly competitive and decentralized. Software industry, less tangible assets. And so was much more um, decentralized. And, um, but of course in um, 2010s and beyond, we see more stricter rules on data storage and um, data dissemination as, um, in, as Russia starts re-regulating um, telecoms. Very interesting in, in textiles, one of the first industries um, in Russia to be let go e during the Gorbachev era. So even before the collapse of the Soviet Union, we have textiles let go. To this day, textiles, um, there's really no textiles industry in, in Russia at all. 
Russia has one of the largest apparel luxury markets in the world, yet it doesn't have a textiles clothing apparel industry to, to, um, to supply it um, because it's very decentralized. In the post-Crimea era though, however, as the sector, particularly the technical textiles part of the industry um, becomes more strategic to the government because of the role of geosynthetics and, um, and so forth, we have um, textiles associations and also the Russian government start implementing important substitution policies um, and even Putin going into textile combines that had long been decentralized and privatized um, to, uh, to, to appeal to nationalist um, uh, ideas about you know, the, the building of the nationalist economy to contribute to um, to, to the war effort, to the post-Crimea intervention of, um, of, uh, of the Crimea region, and now, of course, invasion of, of Ukraine. So I see that I um, really don't have that much time left. I want to end here. I'm very happy to discuss um, development outcomes. What, does, what do these national patterns or national configurations of sectoral models mean for development outcomes? And then, of course, very um, happy to um, chat about um, implications for global conflict and um, cooperation. Um, to end, globalization pathways vary by country and sector within country in, um, as a function of interacting strategic value and sectoral logics. And um, these value bonded um, um, rationality institutions that shape these patterns um, will have influence on firm level behaviors and um, they will have influence on development outcomes and also um, uh, and how these countries um, interact in the global economy. Thank you very much. There we go, unmuted. Well, uh, thank you, Rosie, for a terrific overview of that book. I, I want to uh, continue to invite people to put questions uh, in the Q&A uh, function. I'll get to a couple of those in a moment, but I um, just want to throw out one thing to start with, which is, I mean, it's a terrific story of how politics and economics combine. I mean, you have high, very much political elite choices and then economics in the, in the sense of really just sectoral logics and, and inherited structures and so on. Um, but I wanted to press you a little bit more on another kind of politics, which seems particularly relevant to the cases you're talking about now, at least two of them. Uh, that is, to what extent is this driven by, or is, it, is, is what you see likely to be affected by the moment we live in when states like the United States, the global North Europe, uh, seem prepared to use economic weapons to deal with what they see as really problematic behavior. Obviously, Russia is, is you know, exhibit A right now, uh, but, but China is uh, certainly uh, up there. Um, uh, so you know, to what extent uh, do things like that matter in your story, or to what extent would you expect them to start mattering if we now are in an era where we're seeing uh, a much more political approach to uh, transnational economic relations from the global north? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Jax. Um, I should say, well, I want to talk a little bit about kind of development outcomes, right, of, um, of, um, of these national uh, configurations of sectoral models. Because of the development outcomes, now we see governments, right, having, um, needing to respond to some of those development outcomes. And if those, um, and so, you know, with China um, making advancements technologically, right, and, um, and as we see more state intervention um, and, and state intervention to firms that then start bidding to state um, imperatives, then of course, foreign governments, including our own government, will, um, will be wary and want to respond to that. And to your question about, well, you know, as we respond to um, these, uh, 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 these behaviors of, of the state that intervene into these um, economies, what are some um, policies that we could, what, what are some potential solutions, right? Um, you know, I, um, in my interview with NPR earlier last week, um, uh, when um, the aerial surveillance um, of the spy balloon program um, just um, kind of came out and, um, and as the United States was responding to that, um, I, you know, I mentioned that, you know, we could have export controls, right? We could limit, um, the type of um, you know um, products and components that feed into um, defense um, weaponry and 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 um, or potentially defense oriented type of behaviors, um, we could do that. We could um, 
have we, we could start a trade war, right? Which the Trump administration had had, had done so, and then many of those tariffs actually are still in place, um, even during the Biden administration. So there are many kind of different types of policy solutions that we could respond to, um, to um, to some of these out, uh, industrial outcomes. I um, but but what I say though is that what we could do is we could lean into further diversification of supply chains globally. We could, um, as a country, work with other country, um, you know, other economies, right, around the world, whether it's Southeast Asia or Latin America, Eastern Europe, to um, contribute to and to grow ecosystems where we can have um, we can have work with these companies that could then supply the United States, that the United States then could also have markets in these countries. And so it doesn't have to necessarily be a protectionist um, mode um, or a more or, or less liberal mode of reacting to some of the development outcomes and what some of these um, countries are um, are now doing. It could be more proactive, market oriented, more liberal in nature, and even development in nature in terms of, you know, if we work with these countries around the world, we um, could really be contributing to the development of the global south as well. And so those are some potential um, solutions. It doesn't necessarily have to be reactive um, and, uh, and and protectionist in nature. Now, um, just a nod to um, the CHIPS um, and Science Act, right? That in a way is also a United States um, a way of diversifying the supply chain, right? We want to bring some of that supply chain back to the United States, um, but that alone is not gonna be enough. We really need to also be contributing to global development and to be part of, um, of liberal trade um, agreements where we could, um, increase and enhance labor standards as well in, in other parts of the world. Yeah, I think you've uh, answered a lot of the question I was about to take out of the chat, but I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to, to, uh, to expand further. If someone asked basically, uh, are the relevant U.S. agencies doing it right? Uh, is, what is your advice to USTR? You've gotten into some of that. And, and if you want to get into the textiles, Otexa, the Office of Textile and Apparel. Uh, so I put that trade side question out to you from one of our members of our audience. And I would add to that on the investment side. Uh, so we've recently seen CFIUS uh, get beefed up. We've seen uh, the October surprise, as the Chinese like to refer to it, in terms of uh, tighter restrictions on, on export controls. Um, so you know, to the extent you haven't already answered those questions, uh, how would you, you speak to, to that set of policy options? Yeah, I think um, what we could do is, and, and I do think um, the findings of the book could be informative in, um, you know, let's just take um, India, for example, right? There's, um, you know, I one of the sectors I um, look at is tele, uh, is, is textiles. And, you know, I, I um, identify a lot of more protectionist type of policies, but we have also seen um, uh, attempts at liberalizing. Now, attempts at liberalizing that, of course, um, uh, uh, at the, the, some of the re-regulatory efforts still protect um, some of the subsectors that are, you know, viewed as important to, to the India um, nationalist imagination. But in light of the more export-oriented industrialization of textiles, for example, in India, um, what the United States could do in terms of diversification of um, of investment, diversification of supply chains, is to work with um, countries that have, um, you know, opened and liberalized their economies, work with their concerns about um, um, about labor standards. You know, we don't want to be racing to the bottom or, you know, or, or even responding to the race to the bottom. We want to have higher standards, right? We want to um, respect IPR and we want to make sure that we are in the, um, in, in the game of helping to come up with the rules of the game in terms of labor standards, um, IPR, um, intellectual property rights regimes, and, and, and so forth. Um, and, um, and lean into these market opportunities that are available, right? It is very attractive. Um, China's 1.4 potential billion um, consumers and um, but but and, and also businesses. But you know, we are wary of the fact that some of these businesses um, uh, you know, many times also to their own, um, um, you know, disliking too, right? Some of that state intervention that I find in, in the book, that I identify in my book, um, are not necessarily welcomed by the private sector that has um, flourished 
in China. The private sector that during that era of, you know, what I call in my first book, liberalization two-step, right? The macro level liberalization openness in China, that some of that, um, that during some of the private enterprises that have um, come of age across industries during that liberalization two-step era, um, they're not totally happy with some of the state interventions either, um, yet, they're experiencing them. And um, yet they are going to have to um, uh, unfortunately respond to not just the United States um, responses, but also global responses um, to that um, uh, re-regulation that's happening in, in the Chinese economy. So diversify investments and also be part of the global solution of, um, of, of racing to better standards. Yeah, and as you say, the, the current U.S. policy portfolio is kind of a mixed bag on, on this ads, uh, and some of it is, you know, simply hedging against the vulnerabilities from the supply chain. Some of it is um, you know, onshoring for that purpose or, or friendshoring and things like that. Some of it seems downright protectionist, as you say, the Trump tariffs, which were pretty nakedly protectionist uh, and you know, maybe not economically terribly sensible, are still in place. They're not being removed. Um, and we do see this this sort of, uh, of, of targeting uh, with respect to the, the high tech sectors, which you know, we, I think we, one of the questions we have to ask about these policies is short term versus long term effects. So to to try to um, uh, target and injure some of these Chinese high tech uh, sectors because of the dual use, because of the entanglement uh, with the state and, and indeed even the military to some degree, um, gets you something. Uh, but it provokes some friction with the allies about whether we're applying those restrictions evenly and fairly. And of course, it does run the risk of over the longer run. Uh, supercharging what's already a Chinese uh, imperative to be self-sufficient in technology. So none of these things are easy. Um, so we have another question in the chat about uh, what this looks like, and this is unfair because you've done your research on these three cases in a bit in Brazil, but what this looks like uh, if you extend it to other uh, sort of less developed uh, countries, say in Africa. Um, what, what, how, at least how would you ask the questions in looking at those places and what would you expect perhaps to find? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so one of the, um, one of the goals or ambitions of this project is to, um, is in my strategic value framework is to, um, to really, you know, to, to say, to draw the conclusion that actually the strategic value framework could be helpful in helping us understand um, other countries in the world. Now, of obviously, you know, we have to take into account um, market size, population size, you know, the, the, you know, a country's extent of integration into the global economy. With that said, in the, the, the different dimensions of the strategic value framework do allow us to examine quite um, a few of um, interacting factors, right? You know, we could look at well, what are some um, on the sector level, existing um, uh, organization of institutions for the sector. What are some of the existing organizations? What do those patterns look like? How about for the state elites and the business elites um, in, in any you know, given developing country? What are, um, what are some of the economic and political pressures that they are facing? So the objective level of the perceived strategic value. But also, what are some more intersubjective um, ideational um, dimensions of perceived strategic value that may be important to um, government elites and, and, and economic elites? And then in that way, we could then understand how the economy and how some dominant patterns of market governance um, have, have played out even in um, their responses to neoliberalism, right? right? All countries have liberalized and um, most countries in the world are part of the global economy, but they have also inevitably um, come up with rules and regulations. And some of those real regulations may appear illogical to the to the West or to the world. But the strategic value framework, I venture to argue, can help us understand um, what are the economic and political pressures motivating state elites, state economic elites? Um, what are um, some of the ideational value latent um, uh, uh, ideas um, motivating these, um, these countries? And then we can understand the, the dominant patterns of market governance. Then that could help aid investment patterns that can help aid um, even um, you know, development aid agencies in helping to um, understand what are some of the um, uh, areas for um, development that, um, that 
even aid agencies could um, become involved in. Um, one of the, I most recently received um, an invitation to go to Barcelona, IBEI there had um, invited me to do a summer school class on, um, on my book. And that one of the ideas is to see how I can work with um, different um, stakeholders around the world to use a strategic value framework to better understand um, essentially um, development patterns and then also um, um, and how um, investment um, and um, development could um, could could be implemented. Okay, well, thanks. So um, we're running, getting kind of close to, to our time here. We can get at a few more questions. Uh, so there's another one that, that, that picks up uh, on a thread you raised earlier, and this is uh, in the chat, that uh, some Chinese companies may not be too keen on the state's intervention. Uh, and, and indeed, one could specifically point to Chinese companies that are at least adjacent to the sectors where the state's been most assertive. We think of the regulatory storm against the tech industry, the reigning in of Jack Ma, and, and Ant Financial, and Alibaba, and all of that. Um, so you know, how does that fit into the picture, picture that some of these, what were really high-flying entrepreneurs, uh, are seeing their wings clipped a bit? And what mechanisms, what means do they have within the politics of market governance in China to uh, push back and get themselves some space uh, when, uh, when the state hand seems to be more uh, strangling than supporting? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question, those set of questions. Um, so yes, we have seen the, the regulatory storm. And, um, you know, uh, one of the things I do in, in, in the book, in Microinstitutional Foundation of Capitalism, is when I trace across time, is that many of these, um, what may appear to be you know, many controls across time. Some of these um, began to actually come to fruition um, quite early on. And, you know, particularly for those who are operating in the in the tech sector, you know, you know, including FDI may not be in, all that entirely surprised. At the same time, we have had private companies and foreign direct investment been able to maneuver within a more centralized and um, regulatory environment. And so um, there are sector and business associations that do operate, and some of which are quasi-government, quasi right? When, um, when um, WTO happened um, and China uh, started deregulating, the Ministry of um, you know, Textile Industry or some of the more less strategic industries became business associations. The government no longer um, even you know, play a role at all. But other... Um, organizations um, and sector associations, the government continue to have a very important role. Um, even with that said, there, there are potential rooms of um, room for, um, uh, for, man, uh, for quote unquote maneuvering in terms of giving feedback to, um, to, to policy, um, you know, details and so forth. And so there, there are things that at the firm level and at the sector level that, got, that companies could um, continue to, to engage in. But I do, I do have to say though, there have been some quite alarming level of uh, firm level interventions that are um, beyond just industry level interventions. Um, the um there are some sectors though that the government could you know really have just decentralized and given to um the provincial level or municipal level governments um largely for you know for for um for market governance and so in those sectors there are um quite a lot of industries that um continue to um enjoy market access and, and, and so forth. Um, but but th these are definitely precarious times for the more high-end advanced um, industries. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna, as we're getting near the end here, throw out a couple of um, semi-perverse questions here that could get a little deeper into the politics of this in some ways. So uh, tell me what's wrong with these two stories, um, which I think are more supplemental than, than, than alternative. Uh, so one is that, that this is political, but it's political in an even narrower sense, um, and, or in a more fine-grained sense, perhaps. That is, this is playing to particular bases within these uh, these uh, uh, countries, right? So, you know, especially in the Modi era, uh, we have a populist 
of a regime, and so the kind of you know poor rural voters or 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 uh, the low paid low tech sector voters are what you need to do to keep the BJP in power and things like that. So of course, um, you know they get to be a fairly they get a lot of government attention to make sure things are going well, even if they wouldn't fare quite so well in a truly neoliberal environment. Uh, in China, clearly post Jiang Zemin, uh, everything's the three represents. It's 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 gambling on the high tech, uh, entrepreneurial, you know, getting out of the low tech. Uh, stuff, uh, and so that's that's an important power base for the regime. And of course, in Russia, it's the oligarchs uh, who are heavily in resource and infrastructure areas, and that, those are sectors that lend themselves pretty nicely uh, to an oligarchic kleptocracy kind of, uh, or if not, well, was kleptocracy. Now it's a sort of a Putin and pals, uh, providing you don't fall down a stairway or out a window. A uh, Putin and pals, uh, a crowd. So, is that uh, that too cynically political, or does that dovetail with with some of what you're seeing? Yeah, um, I um, will speak a little bit about the about the Russia case that you um, ended with just now. now. Um, and I mean, indeed, you do see that um, even in the textiles interventions, right, the, te the technical textile sectors interventions that we see um, in a country that um, basically marketized and let go of the textiles industry even before the collapse of the Soviet Union, in those sectors, we do see that it is some of the um, the oligarchs, the, the the Putin and Pals that have actually benefited um, in um, uh, in 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 the technical aspects of um, of 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 the sectors that are that the government suddenly um, have, you know are beginning to and. Uh, you know, implement import um, substitution industrialization uh, policies, and so you do see some of that. And so, um, unfortunately, maybe this the, the cynicism may not be incorrect there. Um, and uh, uh, and in terms of um, for for India, I do have to say though the path dependencies of um, of the of the strategic strategic value logic um, certainly holds even across regimes um, or or whoever's in power. So we had the National People's Congress prior to Bo Modi really also um, had um, similar patterns um, played out there too. And so um, even as you know part part of this may be the political populist um, response by Modi, um, a big part of the sectoral patterns you know that are national configurated in nature um, are have um, are dominant patterns across time. And um, and even in China, I you know had mentioned briefly earlier that um, some of the re-regulation, that liberalization two-step that I wrote about in the first book, um, very much um, occurred in the telecom sector. Now, um, as when Xi Jinping came in, it's it's not just about holding control of the operators, right? You know, the, it, it, he's not just the, uh, the the Communist Party now isn't just content with controlling the infrastructural sectors. We have seen the value added sectors, which previously had competed in a very competitive market, um, being re-regulated. That's why um, you know the Alibaba's, the Inc. Groups, the ABCs are seeing intervention in a way that um, it really, it was just the, the musical chairs in terms of CEOs and top management, that musical chair um, intervention, we only saw among the telecom, the China telecoms and the China mobiles, but that is now coming into other sectors of telecoms as well. So dominant patterns hold, but we do see the strategic value logic um, uh, going to the subsector level in a way that um, that maybe we hadn't seen um, in, a, in more of a more liberal environment previously. Well, thanks. We're actually hard up against our stop here. Uh, so I'm just going to thank uh, Rosie Shea. Thank you for joining us today for a terrific discussion. We could go on much longer, except that we can't <laughs> because we do have to stop in an hour. And so again, the uh, the book is by Rosalind Shea. It's the Micro Institutional Foundations of Capitalism, Sectoral Pathways to Globalization in China, India, and Russia. Uh, I urge you all to read it. It's a terrifically interesting book. And please join us for our next FPRI Asia program event. I think the next thing we have on tap is we're going to talk about the spy balloon uh, uh, coming up in a few weeks. All right. Take care and uh, see you soon. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs>